It's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Anne-Marie Marcherell, uh, who is an Associate Professor of Law uh, at the University of Missouri in Kansas City, specializing in healthcare law. Her research interests include healthcare antitrust, regulation, and she has a particular interest in organization and finance, uh, which is particularly relevant to the topic of the, of the day, which is what the heck is Missouri doing about Medicaid? Um, you know, before joining the faculty at UMKC, she had a long career as a health law attorney, including serving as a healthcare antitrust prosecutor. Uh, please welcome me in joining Dr. Marcy Real. So I've informally nicknamed this room, forgive me, uh, all Medicaid all the time. So if you were here for the previous presentation, I only caught the last part of it. I apologize, it's a bit redundant, although I tell my students what? Repetition, what? Is the mother of learning. So if, if any of it was new to you, maybe a little repetition is not so bad. Um, my topic today is specifically, uh, when they said, what do you want to talk? And I said, well, I think I want to say, what the heck is going on with Medicaid expansion? Not like what's going on in Jefferson City, but what's going on nationwide, all right? Um, because I think it's more likely than not. Here we go, my prognostication cap. I always, I put on a cap like Karnak the Magnificent, who remembers the old Johnny Carson skits, okay? Kind of the way Zeke Emanuel does, I make prognostications at the end of health law for my students. I amuse them and amaze them. And one of them is, are you ready? Every state ultimately will expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. Why? The triumph of mathematics over politics is inevitable. The better question is, under what format will the states expand, okay, and how timely. So let's consider original Medicaid for a moment. Um, passed what, 65, implemented 66. Does anybody know how many states were like, I'm all in, and were there lined up and enrolled in original Medicaid the day enrollment opened? See, we're Americans, we're ahistoric, right? But it would set us free a little bit to know that it was just a little over half. Okay, so there were a lot of looky-loos back then as well. No, no, I'm going to watch you try, and I'm going to learn from what you do right and what you do wrong, and then I may jump in later. Anybody know who jumped in last? Arizona. Arizona. Anybody know what year they jumped in? Remember, past 65, implemented 66? 30 years later. Some people are wallflowers for a really long time, as I tell my kids, okay? I thought it was really significant, and in fact, I, I actually wrote something about it that was published somewhere about the fact this time around, Arizona was like, uh, we're on, okay? Because we can learn something that Arizona learned in those 30 years that made it seem like the best idea since sliced bread, okay, to do it this way this time. So, you know, more, more lessons from history, I hope, is part of what we can learn today. All right, so first a little context. Forgive me if it's highly duplicative, but I speak to audiences where it's a mixed group of people. I gather from the questions here, this is a fairly erudite group, but bear with me. Okay, so signed into law on March 23rd, 2010. No one less than Zeke Emanuel told us we should remember that date. Um, its purpose, right, the tripartite purpose, the triple aim, everyone tired of hearing about that, what? To lower costs, to improve quality, and to improve access, right? Um, for all Americans. So I often like to tell people the most interesting thing about the statute is it did not spring fully formed from Zeus's brow, as it were, by which I mean that it is a statute that rolls out in phases. Some parts of the Affordable Care Act took effect, what, immediately. Some, it's a staged rollout. Some are still yet to take effect. In fact, under the terms of the statute, never mind the implementing regulations, it will not be fully rolled out until 2020, which I think was the time when Zeke Emanuel was saying we can't look further ahead. Well, thank goodness it'll be out by then. Okay, We've, it's attracted a lot of attention recently because some controversial provisions have come online, but some provisions took effect immediately. Anybody know? Anybody know like what took effect? The provision about that you may keep a, what? A child on your health insurance, the child until the age of 26, if you are fortunate enough to have employer-sponsored health insurance. You might keep them on notice it was not a provision. If you are a Medicaid recipient to bring your child inside the Medicaid umbrella, you're like, oh, wait a minute. But if we 
think of it as only something that people who have commercial insurance through an employer are entitled to. We know we all pay, all workers, all of us, including the uninsured, pay for the tax breaks that make that work. So it is a reverse Robin Hood moment, right? It is a reverse Robin Hood moment to tell middle class people that if you're fortunate enough to have health insurance, you can bring your up to 26 year old. I have an under 26 year old who's on my plan, but I, I see it for what it is. Okay, so the American public loves that one, right? In fact, I often used to create a little list of provisions that would never go away even if the whole thing were repealed tomorrow. That was number one. Okay, anybody know any others that were immediately? For children, not for adults, right? So no more pre-existing condition exclusions. So you're a smart group. You already have some sense, right? That, yeah, some things happened right away and some things take a while. So I give a sort of a list here so you can get some sense of we are in a state of transition. Okay? And actually, like, uh, health insurance is kind of changing around us. As if American health literacy and health insurance literacy weren't low enough, we're changing everything at the same time. So it's a challenge, okay, for people to, some people say to me, oh, the quality of the debate around the Affordable Care Act is so low. And I'm like, is it because people are lazy or is it because it's so complex and becoming increasingly complex? All right, so that gives you a little bit to think about. I, I, I want to take a minute to talk about minimum essential benefits because the, eventually the federal government essentially punted and said that we have these categories, but we're going to leave it to the states. Okay, to, I had a question even before I spoke about, well, what are people entitled to? Oh, well, that's a negotiated. That's going to end up being negotiated, actually, between what the statute called out as areas that must be covered. I often tell my students, well, these categories essentially tell the health insurance world, listen, if you're not playing in these areas, it's not health insurance. Now, the most remarkable is mental and behavioral health treatment. Okay, some of us are old enough to remember when mental and behavioral health treatment was considered a health treatment in the United States, but for most of the past several decades, it has in fact been what? Pretty much an optional service, carved out, covered by a separate insurance plan. What do you do if you sort of stood up and said, oh, I need mental or behavioral health services, be like, go over there, right? It was not, as it were, housed in what we think of as the sort of central home of health care. And we treated it that way, right? And we set all kinds of different rules, right? That's why anybody who has a mental health or behavioral health policy knows it has all kinds of what? Annual caps, limits, co-pays uh, that you didn't see, okay, elsewhere in your insurance, or at least not as draconian. Well, so I always tell people, I'll tell them when we see uh, the Affordable Care Act ultimately is an extremely conservative kind of reform, and indeed it is. But I'll always tell them when we'll get to a transformative moment inside that exceedingly conservative reform, there we are. Transformative moment number one. Mental health and behavioral health is coming home. Okay. All right. So I, I, I always tell people about this because I want them to realize that, you know, preventative services are also an interesting addition. Um, and it's hard to say how far we will go uh, in extending these, but I do think that uh, the sort of uh, the day where if you wanted to be screened, you had to go to a public health clinic are over, and I actually think are gonna be much more aggressive screening. Okay, and then finally, I always let to know, people know, because I get a lot of questions about this, what the heck is happening <laughs> with Medicare Part D? One of the few places where the Affordable Care Act actually takes uh, a direct aim at delivery of services in Medicare. It says a great deal below the surface about the financing of Medicare, okay? But above the surface, kind of like uh, an iceberg, you know, 10% above, 90% below the water. Above the surface, I think the biggest difference is Part D. And seniors are amazingly confused, okay, because the the, the so-called donut hole, technically called the coverage gap, everyone knows is what? Closing gradually. And there's nothing like not having a bright line, right, about how it closes to confuse everyone. It's worth knowing that about 40% of seniors currently fall into the coverage gap. People are always astonished in certain circles when I say that because they assume, oh, it's a tiny percentage of people who essentially end up in what? On insurance land for some period of time. No, actually, I'd say 40% is close enough to be normal. The new normal 
is to spend some time in the Part D coverage gap. And that's why you're not going to be surprised to know that every time I talk to a group that involves seniors or elders, they're all over this. This is the thing they want to discuss the most. When does the donut hole close? Anybody know fully? My prize student. Yes. Okay. So you can tell people, it's closing gradually. Hold on. When I say 2020, what do old people do? They laugh because they were not hoping to have what? Post-death benefits. So, um, you know, uh, it, it's interesting from a public policy perspective, from an individual perspective, maybe a little less compelling. A few words about the individual mandate. I can't resist because I'm a law professor and also because I think that the Affordable Care Act's visit to the Supreme Court, visit number one, right, because Hobby Lobby was a visit number two. And I predict, you heard it here, how big versus HHS, the subsidies case, will be visit number three. Well, I always tell people, the Affordable Care Act, the gift that keeps on giving, okay, I call it uh, a, a round-trip ticket to the Supreme Court. Not a, not a single, it's going to keep going. Okay, so trip one, okay, right, which was the, essentially asking, well, can, you, can Congress do this, and, and what is it if they can do this? I think the most interesting thing about the individual mandate is they essentially said, yes, they can, and only to law professors is it interesting that it's a tax and not a fee, <laughs> okay? Um, and then along the way, they also said, and this is the thing that should be interesting to it all, and by the way, that Medicaid expansion that none of you thought was really controversial, it bugs us. Right? It bugs us, and it bugs us because it's coercive. Now, coercive is not a word that is easily defined in the law. Kind of like pornography with Justice Potter Stewart. He said, I know it when I see it. Okay? The, the justices had a similar reaction about coercion. The federal government offers some kind of financial incentive to the states to expand Medicaid. How do we know what dollar amount or what percentage of state budget or any other way that you want to cast it makes something coercive? We still have no guidance. Remember I told you the gift that keeps on giving, because that will probably have to be litigated at some point. But we do know at least that what was offered, okay, is an incentive payment, the FMAP match, right, at 100 percent, at the penalty of being, what, removed from participation even in original Medicaid was held to be coercive. So there, you know, we have one point of light. Right? Just one point of light. Can't do that. So what do they do? Essentially, they rewrite the law. Yeah, judges do that all the time. Sometimes. They rewrite the law. Okay? And they say, well, you know, this thing that you're doing that you want to make mandatory, if you want to be, you got to sort of be all in or all out of Medicaid, we're going to say it's optional. Where did they get that idea? Well, those of you who know much about Medicaid know that we do that all the time. Don't we? All the time. The federal government says, hey, we have a little special program that we want to run. We want to offer you a special FMAP deal if you'll participate. That's the matching percentages, right? And states opt in or out. So they actually borrowed a model from our existing repertoire of models. I think, in some ways, I think that my talk should always be named something like everything old is new again. Okay, and, and, and I, you know, I went to law school with Elena Kagan. I think the world of the intelligence level of everyone on the Supreme Court, but I do think that they're not particularly imaginative thinkers, so it was almost inevitable that they would look to other models within the program itself, okay, for a solution about, or if we're not going to say you can organize it that way, how else can you organize it, right? So minimum essential coverage is upheld by the United States Supreme Court, all right, as the equivalent of a tax for having health insurance. I promised my daughter, it's my joke in my family, everywhere I go I say, if they look tired and they're dropping off, I'll talk about Ebola. Okay, here's my Ebola moment, are you ready? <laughs> in the oral argument, I know, it went on for days and days and days, and I, you finally met somebody who listened to it all and read the entire transcript. In the oral argument, the justices between themselves got in a kind of a little debate about whether or not people could be forced as a public health matter to have to buy health insurance, and then moved on to vaccinations, and then moved on to emergency vaccinations. They never said Ebola, but for some sort of incredibly dangerous, deadly disease. And you need to know. Now, this was not, this was just conversation, but you need to know a number of them were not persuaded that the government has the authority to require 
a vaccination against a highly contagious infectious disease. Now, if that doesn't keep you up tonight, I don't know what should. All right, so that was our Ebola moment. Like, we could learn something about how actually, if we came to this mandatory forced inoculation, if we did develop a vaccination for Ebola, might actually play out at the Supreme Court. And the answer is, I don't know. It seems somewhat intuitive. But actually, I think the thing that uh, Enfib versus Sibelius and all the other cases teach is that intuition, you might need to put that aside, <laughs> okay? Because intuition will only take you so far. All right, so the interesting thing is that all of this, none of this was disturbed, all right? So the, the irony is that it was probably the Medicaid expansion that took the biggest hit at the Supreme Court, all right? I also finally just want to show you shared responsibility payments. One of the most common questions I get is, okay, I'm uninsured, what's it going to cost me? Right now, you do understand there's a group of people who are permitted to be uninsured under the statute, right? If the cost of insurance would exceed a certain percentage of their outcome, uh, excuse me, of their income. What I tell people, the way I describe the Affordable Care Act is I say Medicaid, as it was designed, was to push a certain percentage of the population up from below. The exchanges with subsidies and premiums were designed to push. And so the gap, the coverage gap for health insurance was going to narrow. Okay, states that have opted out of Medicaid expansion, obviously that, that gap stayed larger, although it has narrowed, interestingly enough, even in those states. All right, and, but there were always going to be a gap. The best, my, my best analogy, who likes those really sickly sweet drinks they serve in Italian restaurants, you know, the layers of the liqueur? They're like beautiful to look at, but deadly to drink, okay? You know, green, blue, or the Italian flag colors, kind of like that, okay? There's the layers. And, they might change size, but it was never going to be universal coverage. Once you understand that, it both illustrates how deeply conservative the proposal was, but it also gives you some insight to, okay, so what we're arguing about is how big the coverage gap will remain. All right, and then finally, exemptions. I get lots and lots of questions. I gather you're gonna have a speaker later about the First Amendment implications for the rollout of the Affordable Care Act. I will simply say, that um, that's probably also the constitutional gift that keeps on giving, because now that a closely held corporation has the what? Has the rights of an individual, see Citizens United, right? Comes to the Supreme Court under the Hobby Lobby case saying, and this deeply, deeply close, you know, really genuinely held religious beliefs are offended by having to offer some of that panoply of services, and they say in a closely held corporation context, we will allow the corporation to exercise its First Amendment rights, essentially, right? So, of course, the question, which was asked at oral argument, but no one answered, so I'm waiting for the closely held corporation that's run by a family of Jehovah's Witnesses who exclude the use of all blood products from their health insurance plan or the closely held corporation that's run by a family that's deeply committed and invested in Christian science and excludes the use of everything except a Christian science practitioner. So, you know what? Also, I think the return ticket is probably lingering on someone's dresser, okay? Because lots of people in the United States have very strongly held religious beliefs and lots of people form closely held corporations okay, usually organized around families, um, and have employees who are not of the family as well. All right, so I thought, let's start with Medicare and Medicaid. I know you all know it, or I hope you all know it, but you should know that in the oral argument for uh, the first visit to the Supreme Court, one of the justices who shall remain unnamed here in a great moment of candor said, Medicare and Medicaid, on the record, I get them both confused. So if you're still confused, or if you ever were confused, congratulations, you're qualified to sit on the United States Supreme Court. All right, well, so I always think it's worth taking a moment just in case there's anybody here who's like, what is she talking about? Okay, so the, the crude rule of thumb would be something like Medicare is 100% federally funded, right? Healthcare for, we typically think of elders or seniors, but also some of the disabled, typically those with a work record that gives them attachment, okay? Um, and then Medicaid, we typically think of what? The low income, the disabled without the established work record, 
right? But I think the more interesting way, now you, you get the M&Ms a little bit straight in your head, is to think about Medicaid's origins, all right? Um, Medicaid, some people may or may not know, of course, was passed in 1965, but did anything, was there a precursor to Medicaid? Does anybody know that? The Wait, no. Yeah, and there were others. There were, <laughs> there were others, right? But I, so first I'm gonna go way back in time and then fast forward. So come with me. I always call this the way back machine moment, okay, in my classes. So the origins of the thinking about why poor people, provided they're sufficiently deserving, should be given health coverage as well as something to eat, okay, and something to do and a place to lay their heads, probably for our culture are, are from the Elizabethan poor laws. Okay, and it's important. Uh, the form that we would most likely represent them and the poor laws went through so many phases, probably in the 17th century, where laws were passed to support the poor. The interesting thing is the poor had to come forward and identify themselves as poor. They had to petition a local justice of the peace, so it was heard on a case-by-case -case basis. And then that justice of the peace had to order some relief. That relief fund was created by taxing everyone who lived within the parish. Life was organized by <laughs> parishes then, okay? And so some allocation would be made, including an allocation for health care. Now the interesting thing about it is that meant every justice of the peace kind of went on their own standards, okay? Not only that, so on the micro level, but even on the larger level, poor laws were different in Scotland and in Ireland than they were elsewhere. Poor lawyers differed from county to county. Poor lawyers were different in England and different in Wales, okay? And they essentially were no single system and no single system of records. So some people figured this out and figured they could game the system by kiting along from parish to parish. This was radically decentralized, right? They guess they didn't have electronic medical records. But they're not that far from us, okay? Those of you who know anything about how public assistance for most of the history of the United States is distributed, know that it was driven down to the lowest political unit, by which I mean often to the county level, right? And so there was incredible variation. One of the first things that happened when the Affordable Care Act passed and there was talk about standardizing eligibility for Medicaid was that several people approached me privately and said, what a relief, because those, those eligibility for Medi-Cal, which is California's version of Medicaid, differed from county to county. and sometimes from office to office. So we are not that far from our Elizabethan forebears, okay, in our drive to radically decentralize um, authority. Now there's a lively scholarship among historians about whether the poor had a right to relief under this system and whether that right was legally enforceable or whether it was just custom. And you can see there the origins of Medicaid, right? What is it that we give people when we give them Medicaid, right? Is it largesse, we give of our excess, or do we give an entitlement, right? All right, so uh, let's fast forward to Medicaid. Before the passage of the Affordable Care Act, states, by that I mean the plural of states, commitment to Medicaid was also variable, highly variable. Why? Because Medicaid is often described as a joint state federal program and considerable discretion beyond some bare minimums was given to the states to define who the worthy poor are. So I often, now you know, I often say I'll show you a poor house from Minnesota from a postcard. Somebody thought at some point it was important to make a postcard of a, of a poor house. I, I show you that Medicaid is 50 different versions of what it means to be the deserving poor. I used to put up like a blot from a Rorschach test. What do you see? That will tell you what you think your Medicaid plan is, but now I'm more inclined to hold up a mirror. What do you see? That will tell you what your Medicaid plan uh, looks like both before and now courtesy of the Supreme Court after Medicaid. So I thought you might be interesting to see what reflects back in proposed recipients of Medicaid, okay? So this would have been if everyone expanded Medicaid, how would the face of Medicare recipients change. And this is my moment to make my most astonishing aside. What do we call people who receive Medicaid? Aside from perhaps unfortunate. What do we, what, they're called Medicaid? Recipients, that's the old term. What are they now under the law? Yes, the language was changed. 
Beneficiaries. What do we call people who receive Medicare? Beneficiaries. I often tell my students, if you didn't catch that, if you weren't up all night reading the Federal Register in the summer of 2012, you wouldn't have noticed that CMS published a notice saying from now on, we're going to call people who receive Medicaid beneficiaries. And here's what they said. We have removed the term recipient from current CMS regulations. So they did. They went and they wiped it all. I stumbled on this by chance. I was doing research around that time. I thought, it must be the wrong section of the statute. And we've changed. We've made a nomenclature change to replace recipient with beneficiary throughout the Code of Federal Regulations in response to comments from the public to discontinue our use of the unflattering term recipient under Medicaid. We have been using the term beneficiary to mean all individuals who are eligible for Medicare or Medicaid services. I know you missed it too, but it tells you everything. This was the government's attempt, the statute was Congress's attempt to make Medicaid look more like Medicare in every way. Now you could argue whether or not it's a field attempt. And the signal or the sine qua non is we even change the way we talk about people who are enrolled in this program. All right. So you see how the face change, would have changed. And I want to suggest to you that some of those changes are precisely what made this so contentious. You in fact see that, as you already know, some of the biggest changes would have been for single individuals. Overwhelmingly, what? Strangers to Medicaid. Single individuals without dependents, strangers to Medicaid. Now, no longer strangers to Medicaid. So you know as much about the Elizabethan poor laws as I've told you, or maybe more if you've studied them on your own. Why do you suppose single individuals without dependents historically were strangers to Medicaid and to its precursor programs? Yeah. You don't have a convincing story to tell me about why you are the worthy poor, right? Because in our society, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? Not having health insurance is an indicator that you are not motivated to go and get a job that has health insurance attached to it. And that's essentially your problem, right? So some states have something called general relief, which is a kind of a safety net, bare bottoms, kind of stipend for people who fall through that standard. But typically, is a limited number of states and very modest. So you're already onto it, OK? Is it people like, whoa. We're changing our expectations. We're changing our ideas about who's worthy. We, in fact, would move to a system where what? We make no inquiry about whether or not you're worthy. We just say, tell us your, tell us your story. Tell us your income story, right? And even for people who Medicaid who are not disabled, we don't even want to hear your asset story, right? Which is always the one like you could make a living, right? Trying to figure out how Medicaid was going to treat various assets, a ludicrous living for a long time, okay, you know, well, I have a prepaid burial plan. Oh, there's an exception for that, you know, a ludicrous living. But all those, we, we're not necessarily so interested in the backstory anymore. We accept you as you are. And apparently the Supreme Court said, and actually if you listen to Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, his questioning there, and he wrote that opinion. And at the Supreme Court, I don't know if you know this, but the Chief Justice gets to assign who writes the opinion. So he assigned it to himself. And another little tidbit, they assign it the day after oral argument. People are like arguing months later. I'm like, somebody has written it already. <laughs> OK? Just so you know. All right? The cake is baked awfully fast. OK? And that has to go around for negotiations. And we saw evidence of that. But I think Chief Justice Roberts commented at oral argument where he was like, he actually called this out. He actually said states are entitled to have differences of opinion, he didn't use the worthy poor term, but about what the scope of this program should be and what populations it should reach. And so I was not surprised when he chose to write it and chose to write it himself. All right, so I thought it might be interesting just to spend a second looking at, can we drill down and look at Missouri? I have a feeling the last presenter probably gave you more and better data, but at any rate, I wanted to show you what the coverage gap looks like in Missouri at present because we are a non-expansion state. You should know that from the rest of the world's perspective, we are not an unambiguously non-expansion state. Okay, there are states that there is no activity at all. Can we put Kansas in that group? Okay, there were states that expanded early. Did you know that? 
There were states that expanded early. We'll put California in that group. And to tip my hat to Zeke, Zeke Emanuel, I'll say the world's sixth largest economy, the state of California, expanded early. Okay, which I always, always thought was interesting when people talking about, we should repeal this. I didn't know whether I should tell them that the train had left the station. Okay, one in four Californians is enrolled in Medicaid, AKA Medi-Cal. So it would actually have to be putting Humpty Dumpty back together again, okay, for a significant part of the American population. I was just to say, well, you could repeal it, but I don't really know, you know, how that would work and if everybody would jump on board with you. So not only did California expand early, do you know they got a waiver to expand more generously than the terms of the Affordable Care Act? I know, we hear so much about the resistors, we don't hear about the other end of the, of the continuum. Indeed, they, when they received their waiver to expand early, a waiver to roll out early also gave states permission to not have to do everything at once. Okay, to sort of entice them, to sort of do it gradually. And California's version of not doing everything at once is it went to its individual counties, its most populous counties, and said, anybody want to roll out early? And it's okay to do a partial rollout, like a staged rollout, okay? And several counties took them up on this, including some of the most populous counties in California, counties that probably have populations that are higher than the four state area combined, okay? And what did they do? They experimented. Some of them actually experimented to the extent that they raised the level of Medicaid eligibility far beyond what the Affordable Care Act set as the floor. They said, well, it's just the floor. We think you're, you know, you're way poor even if you make double that in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're in Alameda County. We're going to experiment with having that be the standard. So lots and lots of stuff started to happen right away. Missouri kind of stayed put, and I think you heard in the last talk, I won't belabor what happened. So what does it mean? Well, so it means that we freeze with our status quo, but something else happened that nobody else talks about. All the other provisions stayed in place. The Supreme Court did not strike down the provisions that say, and by the way, the disproportionate share payments from Medicare, because there's DISH, Medicare DISH, and Medicaid, Medicaid DISH, are going to go away. Now, why would you build that into the statute? You'd build it into the statute because what's DISH? DISH is what? Federal money in the back door is how I describe it, right? What's Medicaid? Federal money in the front door, okay? If everyone's supposed to have, kind of like those insurance commission commercials, you ever seen those where everybody has a dollar above their head? If everybody who enters hospital land is supposed to have a dollar above their head because of the way the, the act was designed, we don't need to pay you the money through the back door. It was always federal money, and it was one out of ten Medicaid dollars. Once I was invited to a conference jointly sponsored by a law school and also many representatives of CMS there, it was held in Baltimore and I was asked to speak about dish payments and I said, you know, if we were talking, if we were arranging the agenda for speakers by who was talking about the highest dollar value, I would have been your keynote. I would have been your keynote. Okay, if we were just following the money in how we talked about things. So one out of 10 Medicaid dollars, who knew, was coming in the back door. It was always federal Medicaid money that was keeping. It was always Medicaid money that was keeping some facilities afloat. And I gather you, you spoke in the last segment about, so now we've changed that we will not have Medicaid expansion, at least not for now in some states, so that Medicaid money can't flow in the front door. And then someone who was, making a, who was here from a hospital or a hospital association said, and so hospitals are closing. And of course, if you know anything about math, you, your answer would be yes, and more will. Okay, because the lack or the slow dialing down of the dish money almost makes that inevitable because it was federal money. Can I just ask? Yeah. Well, there's different kinds of DISH, but the one that's most significant for hospitals is that it's disproportionately serving that population. Now, the DISH program, any of you who know much about it, came to be highly gamed. Okay, there have been studies that show that it, it, DISH money was not going to the kinds of facilities. It was on its way out anyway, whatever happened, because of the gaming problem. 
Okay? Anybody going to be surprised to know that a fair amount of dish money went to suburban hospitals? That's what gaming means, right? Yes, and that's under a, a separate rural support program, okay? But DISH is like, I don't know, the elephant in the living room that nobody wanted to talk about because otherwise people would have to say, that was the federal money that was keeping these facilities open or keeping more of the marginal ones open by, by deciding not to expand Medicaid and letting that be taken away. How is it that those facilities would continue to operate, okay? It would, be, it would be hard to say. So finally, I thought that I put this up here. This might be useful as you actually talk to real people. I think it's useful for people to think about that, the numbers, actually, for the coverage gap. All right. So I thought it might be interesting to now really, now that we have our context, to talk about the current state of Medicaid expansion decisions. This changes almost on a daily basis. So forgive me if I you know, have some slight inaccuracies. I want you to understand it's a little like killing a chicken and reading the entrails, especially the ones where you say, it may be going to happen. Okay, I may be not such a good prognosticator. But I think the interesting thing to see here is that um, it ain't over till it's over. It is not a time-limited offer. Just like the story I told you about original Medicaid, it was not a time-limited offer. You know the federal government could have said to Arizona in what, 1985? Sorry, right, we withdrew our offer. They were like, come on in. And indeed, Arizona eventually got on board with original Medicaid with a 1115 waiver, which will be our term of the day, right? Because from here on out, we're probably going to talk most about 1115 waivers. The waivers that allow, it's the process by which a state may approach the federal government through CMS and say, well, you have these parameters to what you want Medicaid to look like. We have another idea, but we would need to fund it with Medicaid dollars. It's negotiated, it's agreed upon, it's time limited, and then it's rolled out, supposedly retroactively or retrospectively studied. But it can be continuously renewed. Will anybody here be surprised to know that Arizona, to this day, still operates under an 1115 waiver in Medicaid? In fact, sometimes I put up the, uh, the portal to Arizona's Medicaid program because nowhere on it does it say Medicaid. Okay, so that people can realize, oh, well, they've been given a fair amount of rope. Okay, they've been given, really been given a lot of space, okay, to make something that would work for them. And, and I imagine on the theory, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Um, the federal government has been disinclined to say, okay, now standardize that. No, just keep renewing the waivers. What didn't Arizona learn anyway between the time the offer was put forward, 65, 66, and the time they came in? Well, Arizona took the position that some states take, which is we can reinvent Medicaid. We don't need the Affordable Care Act to do it. You watch. Okay, and they proceeded to reinvent Medicaid, actually multiple times in those decades. Okay, Arizona got a kind of a rude awakening by realizing that its Medicaid population, its lowest income and indigent population, was uh, a population that was difficult to serve because there are significant parts of Arizona, not unlike significant parts of Missouri, that are rural. Right? So it was, I think people immediately target and think about cities, but actually they said, Oh, if we're supposed to serve everyone. And Arizona has the additional wrinkle of a significant number of those Medicaid eligible are people who are Native American, who can, of course, have the right, right, under um, the Indian health care system to return, okay, but can also freely partake if they are eligible for Medicaid. We have an interesting status of tribal nations in our country. We kind of let people kind of move both ways, like a double identity. So they were a very difficult population to serve. Now Arizona said, wait a minute, that's genius. We're going to direct everyone who has a tribal affiliation back to the Indian Health Service. And why would you do that? Who pays for the Indian Health Service? The federal government. And even then, even then, which is an option not fully available in Missouri, even then taking a significant portion of its Medicaid population, diverting it to federal program called the Indian Health Service, they were not able to make it work. And that's why they eventually folded their tent, yes, decades and decades later, and joined. And I, of course, have no in, you know, privy to any private information, but if you asked me why Arizona was one of the first in line 
for expansion this time, I would say that's why I told you that story. Okay, because they've been down the road of, well, we could do it better on our own. So I show you another map because I like the contrast. It's essentially the same data. It shows you where the states stand on Medicaid expansion. I like it because it shows you that the L, the L of, of those who are, of course, anybody who knows anything about demographics, roughly coincides with the poorest states in the United States. So what do we have? We have a system whereby, remember, the Supreme Court did not say if you don't expand Medicaid, you don't get taxed for it. Remember what I said? Remember, they didn't do that. So we have a system where the L states, the residents of those states, are taxed for a Medicaid expansion in which they will not partake, and yet they are the poorest states. I call this out to you as a reverse Robin Hood moment, right? We are in the interesting situation of seeing the poorest citizens of the United States working to finance Medicaid expansion for the richest states. Yeah, well, I guess I wanted to tell you that everyone counts these differently. Arizona, okay, so Arizona, I look at there and I go, what are they doing in blue? And I look at the top and I said, Wisconsin, I realize there's rural and urban there, and they've had that whole big fight over the union and so forth, but I'm surprised they're solidly. So the slides are not from the same source. Just as I kill the chickens and read the entrails, so they do. Kaiser Family Foundation counts the noses very conservatively. Okay, I think this might be from the Commonwealth Fund. Uh, I'm sorry, it's the advisory board. Okay, counts them less conservatively. I show them to you just for the broad outlines, okay? Because we could disagree about whether it's still a live issue in Missouri. I think it is. You could say it's a dead letter, and we might both be right, okay? But at any rate, I show you this so that you can understand in the broad picture of tax policy, we are at a very extraordinary moment. The way I analogize it to my students is who remembers there was a huge earthquake in Missouri in what year? 1812, right? Possibly the largest earthquake ever in North America, right? We didn't have any of the measuring devices and didn't have the photography. But how do we know so much about it? Because Mark Twain was in Madrid, New Madrid, Missouri, when it occurred, and he wrote about it. And you know what he said? He said, the Mississippi River flowed backwards for eight days. Well, as soon as this reverse, okay, taxation began, I told my students, the way to remember it is the Mississippi River is flowing backwards again. Okay? This is regressive tax policy. So the Supreme Court's rewriting of the statute is non-trivial. All right. Finally, I thought you might like to see something about income eligibility. I show you first Missouri. If there are any Kansas people here, I, I think I have something to show you as well. I wanted you to see, so if we don't expand Medicaid, who is it exactly that we're not expanding it to, right? And we are, of course, tremendously protective of children. Why? Because they are a classic definition of what? The worthy poor, the blameless poor. We don't feel that way about their parents, okay? And here's Kansas in a slightly different format. <coughs> and then you can see the coverage gap. Okay, so all of this makes me want to ask, is this Medicaid expansion or Medicaid transformation? I already answered the question about what do you call a Medicare enrollee? You call them a beneficiary. What do you call a Medicaid enrollee? You now call them a beneficiary. Um, so does nomenclature matter? I say yes. So I thought maybe it would be useful to look at kind of a few examples of what I'm going to call bespoke Medicaid or customized Medicaid expansion. Uh, in this case, everyone started out by calling the, the private option, which is interesting, the Arkansas example. Does anybody know before the Affordable Care Act, were states ever allowed to use Medicaid dollars to buy commercial insurance for those who are eligible for Medicaid? Of course. And some did, just not in these numbers. Remember I told you, the Supreme Court, very, very intelligent, not highly imaginative, okay? I think that might be true about most of us, okay? Yes, there were states that have historically taken Medicaid dollars and used them for small numbers, typically people who were very difficult to insure, okay? 
often people with uh, orphan diseases or whatever, and actually purchased commercial insurance for them. So what we now call the Arkansas option, I always say to people, you know, that wasn't invented in Arkansas, but okay, I, I, you know, I guess I get the idea, um, is the sort of uh, the, the metaphor, as it were, for discussing taking Medicaid dollars and repurposing them in some way. I think the most interesting thing about all this is that each state, and so I've chosen a few what I think are interesting states to talk about, because there's about seven states so far that are, have either gotten approval to do this or are working towards approval, has slightly different ideas, which can tell us something about where Missouri is likely to go. Indeed, where Kansas is likely to go eventually. All right, so I'll, say, I'll start by saying in Arkansas, so Governor Mike Beebe signed the state's expansion plan into law in uh, the spring of 2013. It said, I'll accept federal dollars. Okay, but I want to use it to buy commercial insurance for about a quarter of a million eligible um, low-income residents. Okay, and it was pretty quickly approved by the, by the fall. And there we saw the sort of first step, all right, towards saying, well, okay, so in larger numbers than historically been done. If it was a few thousand, but now larger numbers of people, this could be done. So then let's compare and contrast with Indiana. Is Indiana a Medicaid expansion state? Well. The charts tell us different stories, but we know right now that they just have ideas out there, right? They have a plan, okay? Uh, and they're considering expansion. And I want to tell you a little bit about it because we're, where the government, the federal government comes, it's a negotiation process, comes down, may tell us about what may be possible here. It's kind of a cool plan, too, because it highlights a lot of the most important issues in all the other proposals or even all the other approved plans. Governor Mike Pence in May of 2014 approved something called the, an expanded Healthy Indiana Plan. So HIP or Healthy Indiana Plan pre-existed. All right, he said, I want to expand it. And so this, it had originally been launched in 2008 under a federal waiver. Right? He said, what I want to do is I want to distribute Medicaid funds to eligible residents, roughly $1,100 okay, to Medicaid eligible residents. But I also want to have an accompanying that they can use for a, a sort of a health savings account. Anybody here have a health savings account? Usually paired with what? Under the Internal Revenue Code required to be paired with a high deductible health plan. So you know where this is going if you know anything about tax, right? You're not allowed to have a health savings account if you're not enrolled in what the IRS deems to be a high deductible health plan, okay? That's a a kind of a mechanism that is twinned. All right, so he said, not only that, I want the people who get this money, okay, I want them to have to kick in some of their own money. What do we call this? Skin in the game. I want them to have some skin in the game. Now, what the conventional theory is that Medicaid either was zero coinsurance or very low, right, both because the agency and then courts have tested only de minimis payments, things like $2, okay, were considered tolerable. So. Traditionally, Medicaid was first dollar coverage, right? And only slowly grew up into de minimis payments. And so everyone was like, oh yeah, okay, so what are you talking about? How big do you want the payments to be? He goes, I want them to slide. They could be as low as, you know, five or eight dollars, but it, it, it could be a couple hundred dollars. I actually think that that is what has made Indiana's plan sort of, it's in the pipeline, obviously being negotiated, but stalled. How high? But they'll need a waiver, right? A waiver and a waiver, <laughs> okay? They would need a waiver to do this, right? But they'd also need a waiver from the rule that says, you know, either zero, first dollar coverage, copayment is acceptable, or uh, coinsurance is acceptable, or very modest. Now, the fates of about potentially 500,000 enrollees hang in the balance. It seems to me at this moment they're also playing a real game of chicken because apparently whatever place they've reached, they're at impasse. Nobody is really talking to the press. Everyone's saying, we hope to do this soon. Finally, there's also a work referral requirement. Has anybody heard of that? Okay, not a work requirement, a work referral. And the best thing I can, the best way I can describe it is it's sort of evocative of when you go to collect unemployment insurance. If you ever have, they ask you what? For some proof that you have been what? Ready, willing, able to work, and actively seeking work. And they can ask you that, right, as a condition. And so it mimics the unemployment insurance world. All right, so what will happen? Well, I'm no good uh, prognosticator. I think that nomenclature matters. You know this from hearing me tell you about the change from everybody's a beneficiary now, that these accounts are called personal wellness and responsibility accounts. Just in case you were thinking we left the Elizabethan poor laws 
far behind us, okay? There's our responsibility account. Two more illustrative states, okay? I wanted to say uh, a word, I'm sorry, about Iowa. Okay, in, uh, in the winter of 2013, uh, Governor Terry Branstad announced um, that he had struck a deal with CMS on an alternative expansion proposal using federal funding, bringing 100,000 low-income residents inside the, something called the Iowa Health and Wellness Plan, and it includes a small proposed premium for some. It gives us some sense of maybe there will be premiums in Medicaid, plus a, an additional premium on individuals with incomes exceeding 50% of the federal poverty level, but there would be no penalty for non-payment. Now, if you don't think this is the fullest expression, modern expression of the poor laws, we're going to say that you failed if you don't pay, but by the way, we're not going to go after you. You don't really understand the kind of thinking, I don't think, behind what's going on. What would be the point of having something that someone at 50, who knows what 50% of the federal poverty level for an individual is in 2014 in the United States? What's 100% of the federal poverty level? Well, one person is? It's about, okay, and, and so 50, a premium? But we won't collect it. Well, that I think says a little bit more about us, right? Because after all, does it cost money to bill for a premium? You know that every time, like for instance, a utility company or someone has to cut you an electronic tech, you know it costs eight bucks, right? It does. Okay, Not, so spending money to make a point might be one way to characterize that, right? And then finally, I thought it might be worth talking about Pennsylvania. Very recent, right? Just in August of 2014, a deal was struck. Governor Tom Corbett wants to expand Medicaid, could reach as many as 600,000 uh, with a waiver for an alternate expansion model, which includes premiums for certain beneficiaries. And there, it's not targeted to a certain dollar amount, but a percentage of household income. It wants to have premiums be charged on a sliding scale up to 2% of household income. So we see another way of thinking about it, okay? Um, they did not get what they wanted. They wanted to have what is called a lockout provision for emergency room use for non-emergency purposes. They essentially wanted to say, and all bets are off on co-pays and deductibles if you use the emergency room for non-emergency room purposes. And they did not succeed. So we can already see what states have been asking for and then some of what they get and what they don't. I'm gonna take questions, but I'm gonna say one more thing. I wanted to tell you about Vermont, because Vermont's so interesting. So, you know, way back in 2012, Vermont said, yes, we're all in. All 47,000 people can be in expanded Medicaid. But are you aware that Vermont has already filed for an exemption, a complete waiver from the Affordable Care Act entirely? They are the first state to have done so. The Affordable Care Act contemplates that states will be able to do this. They put a marker on the table already and are developing their plan because they want to go to universal health care. They want to close the coverage gap entirely under a waiver. So it serves to show that the incredible diversity uh, that we don't even hear about, diversity of what's happening in the States is a remarkable thing. Finally, I, I hope I haven't seemed unduly uh, sympathetic or unsympathetic to you know, tailored um, Medicaid expansion because the real bugaboo for Medicaid expansion is, so what if you expand conventional Medicaid? What if nobody takes it? It's kind of like if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it. Was there sound? All right. So while California was adding what? Now one in four Californians are in Medicaid. Do you also know that they have among the lowest Medicaid reimbursement rates in the United States, if not the lowest? And it goes to tell how easy it is to take your Medicaid and get access to care. So actually, I salute the states that are working on this. And I guess I'll take questions. I think I might have five or 10 minutes. Questions, comments? Sometimes I get people from other countries who come to a talk, and, and, and actually, that's pretty much what they say politely, because they're guests here. but. Because the whole idea of having Medicaid standing for the reimbursements are so low that you don't get enough primary care physicians who we need more of to take care of the newly insured and the expanded Medicaid, but a small percentage of them are going to take it because they say, I can't cover the cost of reimbursement. What does that pay you? It's like, you know, in name only.
I guess that that's why I included the last cartoon. I want to make it difficult again. I, I want to make it difficult because it is difficult. Um, and, you know, part of the reason why, why California can expand Medi-Cal in that way is it drives reimbursement so low, paradoxically. In other words, you can have it. Good luck spending it. Okay, so for gay marriage, you look at the map, it looks like we're better for gay marriage in almost every state. Okay, it's whether, you, whether, you're, whether you think it's great or bad or anything, it just seems to be an overwhelming tide moving in that direction. Maybe Utah will be a hold up. Okay, so when you said at the beginning of the talk, I think, somebody said at the beginning of the talk sometime today, almost every state would think it's gay. Actually, I would say, I would go so far as to say every, because right, so I am a scholar of history. So how Because the deal has to be sweet enough, all right? And the deal isn't sweet enough without 1115 waivers for some of these states, all right? They want to still exercise, it's federalism. They still want to exercise some control over the shape. They still want to determine who's worthy to have health care. When the deal's sweet enough, everyone will be in. Okay, so ideology kind of vanishes, the money's You know, I have a kind of a, I, I guess it's maybe, for some of you, a disillusioning perspective, but I, I do think that, you know, mathematics triumphs over politics. Okay, 100% match, 100% payment, well, that's math, okay? So n turning down something that's essentially free for fear that it might be a Trojan horse coming in when you could, in fact, you know, like Monty Python, kick the Trojan horse or the Trojan rabbit back out over the fence whenever you were ready to, I, I, I do think at some point, I, that's why I wanted to tell you the story of Arizona, because I do think the story of Arizona with original Medicaid is a story about the triumph of mathematics over politics. And we watched it unfold for decades and decades. I'm saying it doesn't necessarily going to happen fast. But I'm untroubled by that because I know something about history. None of this happened fast. Other questions? Yes? Well, so you were asking a great question before. I said, please ask it in front of the group. Everyone's aware that one of the essential benefits is mental health. I said it's a transformative moment that mental health is coming home. It's so contentious. It's no accident that the regulations implementing that section were among the last <laughs> regulations to come out. Okay, because what would it mean to say there would be no lifetime limits? All the things that we have come to accept, right? Uh, you know, no limits on the number of annual visits, you know, co-pays, whatever. And so what we can say so far, because there's very little data, it's only very recent, is that I see a tremendous sort of reboot moment in primary care. Oh, this is going to be part of our portfolio to screen for this and to do first line. I think it's actually going to have to reverse ripple all the way back to medical schools, okay, and change, change training, not just in medical schools, but other healthcare you know, professions. This is yours. <laughs> the first cut at this is yours. I, yeah, we'll see. We'll see, right? Yes? What do you think will come of Halbig? I'm sorry? What do you think will come of Halbig? Of Halbig. So Halbig is the case that, okay, at, at, at this point we have different opinions in different places, challenging the sort of language. I think it's a drafting error, frankly, but a hypertextualist reading of language in the statute that says if you don't establish uh, uh, a state exchange, you can't offer people subsidies. Well, obviously the plan is to sort of blow up <laughs> the act from within. Helbig is genius in this sense, right? If you can't offer these, I don't think, if you know enough about insurance, you know lots of things would fall apart, not just people would not get their subsidies. But then you'd have adverse selection in the risk pool, okay, and the risk pool might actually fall apart. So the interesting thing, what do I think will happen? I have a very pragmatic outlook on these things. And if Justice, Chief Justice John Roberts was not willing to take this act down, in National Federation of Business versus Sibelius, he's not going to do it in Halberg versus HHS. All the time, the government makes drafting errors in statutes and regulations, and courts are called upon to read the most commonsensical reading, looking at legislative history, looking at intent, looking at the other moving parts of the statute. All of that is unambiguous, actually. So that sort of hyper-literalist reading, do I think it will win the day? No, I, I don't think so. Well, all I can say is if common sense were not going to prevail, we would have seen indications of that. Remember, this would be what? Trip three, if, if I'm right, and it makes it to the Supreme Court, right? If, if somebody was going to look for any reason 
to knock this out. They had others, <laughs> okay? But I, that doesn't stop people from a lot of sound and fury around Hulbig. And there's a companion case, King, and now we have a third ruling in a federal district court. So they, they all need to kind of get in the same procedural posture before they can go up. I think I'm done. Thank you.